Okay, so we are going to get. Yeah, I just turned the volume up again. This one has to be on, right? Like, you need to trust. You must this one? It's on. Or on. So this should be on there. This, this, on. Uh, oh, this is this is off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's from this one. I said that you have your microphone on. Hello, it looks like. I so this little bit, okay, yeah. sorry, it was my fault. Okay, no perfect. Great, thank you. I was okay, um, so everyone, we're going to get started. So it's going to be Ruben's uh, advanced uh, uh, lecture, so it's the second lecture. So Ruben has to leave us earlier, and that's why... Um, his lecture is a bit concatenated today instead of um, the full one hour and a half, the one hour lecture. So, so yeah, without further ado, so not taking your time. Okay. And thank you, Beijing, for staying up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, I'm going to uh, follow up my first uh, lecture uh, with this uh, cartoon. We already saw this. Uh, the top agent looks a little bit more human like, a little bit more lively. And uh, why we perceive this in this way? And uh, the reason the first agent, the agent was perceived a little bit more lively and, uh, and human-like is that because life is motion and actually is in motion. So uh, animals, humans, uh, even plants, uh, they have a natural tendency to move, to interact with the world with uh, curiosity. Uh, even uh, babies, uh, here we have uh, experts, uh, Stella, uh, it's very well known from the development uh, uh, psychology that uh, they spontaneously uh, uh, bubble uh, vocally very early on. And even before that, they actually move uh, their limbs uh, kind of randomly in what has been called motor uh, bubbling. And uh, Alaya is also uh, very well aware of this, uh, of this kind of uh, uh, observations. Uh, it's very well known that it functions explored with uh, curiosity. And uh, one question that, uh, that we can ask is uh, why uh, we have these kind of behaviors that they seem to elude a simple explanation in terms of, uh, of reward maximization. I mean, what, what is the goal of uh, having curiosity? What is the goal of being motivated to interact with the world? And uh, there, is a, um, there is a common uh, way of uh, uh, common rationale to answer to this question, which is the following. Is that if you move and interact with curiosity with the world, then you uh, learn. If you learn, uh, you can get uh, higher future rewards. So this is the this is the whole idea. But the standard hypothesis here again is that uh, we are not uh, more than a reward or utility maximizers in the classical sense of maximizing some uh, state signal. Uh, uh, quantity uh, that we can measure. And I described in the first lecture, so this uh, view has been dominated many, many fields. So the a challenge that I would like to present to you today is to try to invert this whole rationale. And first of all, are be critical about this question and say, are we actually a reward or utility uh, maximizers? Uh, so this is uh, the case of a uh, of, uh, vacuum uh, a cleaning robot who escaped uh, the room where he was, uh, where he was uh, working, and he was found two days after under a bush outside the, the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so cases like this uh, say very clearly that, well, defining reward functions is very, very difficult. So how do we, if you want to uh, uh, tell this guy what to do, designing the reward function is very, very difficult. And depending on what things you put in this reward function, you can get totally unexpected behavior. And if you observe uh, animal behavior, uh, 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 it's very hard to infer what is the reward function that that animal is uh, been, uh, trying to maximize. So it's a, it's a complicated problem in general. There are many approaches to, to adapt. But how do you design a reward function in this case? 
So you can tell this robot to maximize the amount of dust that is collected per unit of time. You can tell it to uh, focus on a specific type of uh, dust, like, which is more uh, allergenic, more uh, harmful for you. Uh, or you can uh, put the focus on energy uh, uh, efficiency. Or you can design a reward function, which is a linear combination of all of these. But you have here multiple choices, and it's unclear how you should weight each of these uh, components. It's a really very hard to design. Uh, so what I'm going to propose is that the goal of intelligence is this single statement over there, which is occupy action states uh, path space. So why I'm going to propose this, uh, this idea? So here, uh, I'm going to abandon the idea that we are reward or utility maximizers, and that we move or interact with the world to maximize those uh, rewards. I'm going to take this uh, premise, and I'm going to flip it around, and we are going to adopt the opposite hypothesis, which is that moving around in the abstract sense, so I'm not talking only about physical movement, I can. Uh, could be also a mental exploration if you want. Moving around is the goal. Occupying a, a, a space is the world. And external rewards are just the means that we use to achieve that particular goal. So it's completely reversed. So let's see how far we can go with this uh, new uh, plan. So yeah, there's the goal, there's the, the, the principle that I would like to put forward. Uh, this is a little... Uh, Nine for that. So what kind of behaviors we will expect if we design an agent that follows this principle, that is trying to perform many actions, uh, many actions, many behaviors, occupying and visiting many states? What kind of behaviors do we expect to observe? Well, we expect that this agent is going to be curious and explorative. In the broad sense is going to be moving around. So that looks very uh, human-like is going to uh, have an interesting uh, property, which is very similar to what uh, Jonathan was describing uh, before, that even if you, uh, if the agent has a full model of the world, the agent will still move around the world and interact with the world, even if it has complete knowledge, uh, uh, perfect information. Uh, a very obvious uh, implication is that to occupy uh, more space in the future, and to perform many actions, the agent needs reward. So you should observe some goal-directed behavior. So you should observe uh, situations in which the agent goes to get reward to be able to move further uh, in the future. So you, uh, rewards are still uh, kind of in the place, but in a, in a, with a different flavor. These agents are going to have a survival instinct because if you enter into terminal states where you cannot move, then the, then that gives you very little value to that state. So the agent will start to move around while avoiding this terminal state. Okay, in a natural in a natural manner. Uh, of course, they're going to have a preference for freedom. They would like to be in a state where there are many actions to do and many uh, many states to to visit. And um, and we will see that uh, this is again uh, telling to you that we don't, uh, we don't uh, conceive of the state as only the external state can also be internal state to be explored. Or By the way, I can take questions anytime that you want, so I can cut off some parts of the talk with no, no problem, okay? Uh, so this is the, the schematic that I described uh, in the first class of, uh, of the framework of Markov decision processes that is very general, except with some caveats that uh, that Jonathan described. So you start with the state uh, ST, you perform one action, uh, there is a transition to a new state, and possibly you get that reward, and then you keep this doing uh, uh, in many, many uh, future steps. So just to uh, refresh to uh, the memory, so at every state, there are many possible actions that you can perform. And each of these actions are performed with a probability P of a given st, that is what we call the point. Uh, and it's a stochastic uh, mapping. So when you perform the action A, that put the possibility of generating different and possible states. And this is what we call the world model or the transition uh, probability uh, matrix. And uh, possibly after performing action A, after being in a state S, you can get a, a reward. 
And if you remember, we define external rewards as being a state action signal. So something that don't depend on the policy that the agent is, be, uh, is being uh, followed. So that's the classical approach. And then we can define the value function. I don't need to go uh, over it. So now let's take this uh, principle of uh, visiting as the main goal of the agent. And now this uh, signal over here that is going to be sought by the agent is not going to be any more this uh, state action uh, reward that we have described. Uh, before. So this reward signal now is going to be something that depends on the policy that the agent is, is following and with the goal of trying to occupy a space. So how, how we should think of this, uh, of the rewards that we will get. So let's assume that you have a policy when you are in this state that is fully deterministic. For uh, that state, you can only choose one action. Okay, so this is a deterministic policy. And then the gain in performing that action or how much you occupy that action is going to be zero because it's the one that you perform always. So by performing it, it again, you don't gain anything more because it has been already uh, visited, uh, so to speak. So how we should then um, write down like a nice uh, form, uh, mathematical formulation for this reward. So let's try out this function. This is a function that the intrinsic reward is the minus logarithm of the policy of the probability of performing A given S. Uh, if the policy is deterministic, then the logarithm of one is zero, and it gives us this intuition that uh, if uh, there is no gain of, uh, by, this, uh, by performing an uh, action A, if it's the action that we always, always perform. But if we perform an action with a very low probability, there is a lot of gain in, occupan, in occupying that, uh, that action because it's one that we very rarely uh, perform. And that is going to constitute a very large a positive reward because when you take the minus logarithm of a neck of a very small quantity, you get a positive large uh, quantity. Uh, then we can define the action entropy as uh, the action occupancy, sorry, as the expectation of these uh, gains that you uh, will uh, obtain when you perform any of the disposable uh, actions. And this is simply the entropy of the actions uh, when you are in a state as uh, possible. Okay. So now let's go to, to the case of uh, uh, the full transition. So now we get the act, perform the action, and there is a transition to a new state S. So the probability of this transition is given by, uh, uh, by this uh, product, the policy and the, uh, the world model, the uh, Markovian uh, property. And now let's assume that both the policy and the, and the world are deterministic. If this is the case, there is only one action that I can perform over here, and there is only one state that I will reach in the future. Intuitively, when you do this action and you observe the new state, you don't gain, uh, you don't gain any new occupancy of action state space, right? So in that case, we expect that the intrinsic reward by performing that action and visiting this new state is going to be zero, because it's very boring. It's the one that we are always getting again and again. Uh, we can uh, plug this probability in here, and we can think of intuitively as this intrinsic reward as having some interesting uh, uh, meaning because it captures the intuition that we are have uh, we have described over here. So when the policy and the environment are deterministic, the intrinsic reward is zero whenever you perform that action. But if the policy is very random and the and the environment is very random, then you visit kind of very rare action states. Uh, in the world. And this is what you want according to this. Uh, this so that will, that's, that's going to constitute a large positive reward. Uh, so what we are saying is that the immediate reward that you will get by performing a state A and jump into a state uh, S is the sum of the uh, action entropy plus the expectation of the state entropies depending on uh, the action that you have just uh, performed. Okay, so we can extend this uh, in the future and we, and we can define a new value function where instead of having the, the uh, 
uh, state action uh, rewards, well, we have this, this policy dependent uh, rewards that model this intrinsic motivation to visit actions and states in the world. So we'll have a precisely a uh, very similar form to the one that we have uh, uh, described in the previous class is a distanted sum of uh, action and state entries. So here you will, uh, uh, you will uh, balance getting immediate entropy in terms of actions if you think that in the future you are going to get a lot of entropy. So you can trade off uh, immediate entropy with future entropy, immediate freedom with future uh, freedom, if you want. Okay, so one very interesting uh, piece of math that I'm going to go really, very quickly over this is that this is the only measure that has this very interesting pr uh, property. So if you want to build a mathematical measure of occupancy of action and states, this is pretty much the only form, except with some coefficients, that you can, uh, you can use if you ask or what we call the additive property, which is the idea is that when you occupy the occupancy of a path of any length can be broken into the occupancy of the short, the shorter, uh, shorter paths that compose that, uh, that path. So what are these uh, desired properties of action state path occupancy? So let's assume that you are in this, uh, in this state, we call it the action state, but can be a state only. And uh, you can reach to these uh, other action states, and there is a, a, a transition probability uh, of going from I to, to J when you follow a specific uh, policy. Okay, so how do we define intuitively? Uh, well, this is what we will call a, a path of length one, because there is just one step forward in the future. Okay, so how do we find an intuitive notion of occupancy of, uh, of that state over there? So, what we want is that uh, the the gain that we have uh, in, occupy, in occupying a new state is going to depend on the probability of this transition. Okay, so we want the occupancy gain to be, to be a function of that uh, probability. Okay, local, it has to be local information. And the second thing that we want is that uh, this function should decrease with the, with the probability, meaning that if I perform a very low, uh, a very rare uh, transition with very low probability, the gain in occupying that state should be very hard, should be very large. So I want to have a decreasing function of P uh, as, uh, as C. Uh, this is one example. Let's assume that this is the, under the policy that we are following, that these are the transitions. So this is kind of the emptiest path. So if you perform, if you uh, uh, perform this path, then it's going to give you higher intrinsic motivation, higher intrinsic reward. Well, uh, we ask C to be a smooth uh, function, and this is just a definition. So we define the occupancy of one step pass as simply the average of the occupancy gains when you perform any of the possible actions that you have over there. So it's this average over here. Okay, so what, the, what is the additive property uh, about? So the additive property is going to tell you something about what, how we should define, how we should extend this definition to paths of length uh, two by using the same notion of, uh, of occupancy. So the idea is that uh, you can interpret a path of length two as, again, as an object that has some probability, and we uh, need to use the same occupancy gain measure that we have used in the previous case. So we should use the same way of quantifying how much we occupy this new object that then now is two steps forward, as opposed to be just one step forward. And this is the additive property. So we want is that the occupancy, when you start from I, state I, of pass of this uh, two, this is the definition. So we essentially, we, uh, here we, there is a sum over the probabilities of each of the paths that you can have. That's why you have here the product, okay, over the index. And this has to be the sum of the immediate occupancy, average occupancy, plus the expected occupancy when you start from the ending points of the first uh, shorter path. Okay, so we want this to property, this property to hold, to have a consistent measure of, of, uh, of uh, occupancy. And uh, the only way to satisfy this equation under these constraints is by uh, using the, 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 the minus log, something proportional to the minus log. Uh, so why is that? So this is the, the condition that we want to have. 
So let's do the math. So this is the occupancy of parts of the uh, tube. This is this quantity over here. So we are going to plug in here this answer. So here we have the minus logarithm of this uh, of the product of these probabilities. Now we use uh, uh, that the logarith logarithm of the product becomes the sum of the of the logarithm. So we have two terms. The sums are identical so far, but the terms are, are very different. They're so different that the first one actually you can perform the sum over the over the the, the second step states. Okay, so it's going it's going to go away. So you get this uh, sum over here, and the second uh, sum you can separate the sum into two components. One is the transitions to the first uh, states. Further and then later on transitions to the second uh, second state. And uh, if you remember the definition of uh, of uh, uh, occupancy of patterns of the, of the, uh, one, what you have is this is the uh, ci uh, uh, one plus the expected occupancy starting from the intermediate state. So the log satisfies this uh, condition and actually is the only function that you can. Use. So you're bounded to use this uh, this uh, formalism. Uh, here we can generalize these to different values of alpha and beta so that you can weight more entropy of actions versus uh, entropy of, uh, of transitions. So there is some flexibility in, in the framework. And uh, not surprisingly, you can build a, a Bellman equation by assuming the exponentially uh, exponential temporal discount in the same way we have described in the first uh, in the first class. Where what we have is that the value of the other state S under policy P is going to be the immediate uh, occupancy, the immediate occupancy that you obtain in the first step, plus a discounted uh, occupancy of the states that you're going to visit in the future. And you're going to have a very nice uh, trade-off between what you can get in terms of occupying or being free immediately versus what you can get in the future. So the first term is the conditional entropy uh, of uh, the action given the state. Right. The second term is the conditional entropy of the transition matrix. So right. The next right. state given right. the action. Right. right. But if I just take this, and you you want to maximize this, so shouldn't I just have a transition matrix that sends S and A to any S uniformly and S? Well, it's in here. It's in, it's in the expectations so under, under the policy. Yeah. So there is here an average over the over the over the actions. No, no, I understand. I'm saying if you optimize, if you maximize ah, this, okay, optimize, yeah. wouldn't you just say that transition matrix should send any state to any other state uniform with uniform probability and does that does and, that yeah and the policy should be that the actions uh, yeah yeah so that that's kind of the yeah that's the game. So the idea is that you want to be as uh, random as possible. In terms of actions, but also in terms of uh, of uh, states, of future states. Like here, there is a trade-off. Uh, uh, maybe it's not possible to be uh, totally uniformly random on the on the state transition matrix uh, on, on the effective transitions from S to S prime. Maybe there is no such a policy uh, uh, because yes, the transition matrix just force you to go to a specific uh, states again and again. So you cannot make that transition to be uniform if. For, uh, so here you fix the transition matrix. Yeah, the transition matrix is fixed. So you don't optimize. The no, 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 no. The transition matrix uh, defines the the environment, defines the the, the the agent, and the only thing that the, the agent is free to choose is the policy. Okay, so you can build, uh, you can solve this uh, uh, system analytically, and you get a self-consistent equation for the optimal values that has this. Uh, Say where there are no extrinsic rewards, and there is the optimal policy that this uh, is a softmax uh, rule, as we have described uh, in the first class. Uh, okay, so let's give uh, a few examples to clarify uh, what uh, what uh, Robert was asking precisely. So let's assume that you start with this state, and there are only two actions in the world, right or left. That's it. This is what you have in the world. Uh, but there is a, a possible transition to the next state that uh, is going to be if you perform <coughs> action A with probability one half, you jump into a state S1 or a state S2. But if you perform action A2, there is a deterministic transition to S3. So the question is what is the optimal uh, policy if you want to maximize occupancy of actions and, and states? 
Okay, this one is suboptimal. So if you choose with probability one half uh, either of these two actions, then you end having that you visit uh, this state S3 more than either S1 or S2. Okay. So the optimal policy in this case is uh, choosing the first action with probability two thirds in such a way that every action state, here you have two, th uh, three action states, this one, this one, and this one, any of those are chosen with probability one third. And that's going to maximize the immediate uh, occupancy or the immediate uh, entropy. That's optimal. So now let's assume that the world continues over, uh, over time. So if you perform uh, action A1 and you end up in uh, state S1, you only have one action. So this is a very boring state. Here, this is the same, but this is a super interesting state because from this state, you can perform many, many actions. So then what you should do, then the optimal policy changes completely. Now you should uh, choose with probability surely larger than one third, this bottom branch over there, because uh, in the future, you're going to get more uh, intrinsic uh, reward based on the availability of many, many actions. But what happens, is that if you follow this path, then you die with probability one. Well, in that case, because you know that when you enter in this state, you're not going to be moving into the future anymore, your entropy is going to be zero, uh, then this path is no longer the zero as compared to the, to the one on the top. But here you can see there is going to be all these trade-offs between avoiding terminal states and visiting states or uh, where there are going to be many, many possible actions. Um, okay, so this is a summary of uh, methods that uh, we have uh, described. So this is the Bellman equation. Here you can plug a, a reward that depends on a, a state S and A and possibly on, on, on the policy. And this reward contains can contain possibly all these many times. And in all these cases, we know how to solve the, the problem, right? So this first case is the standard RL, when there is just an external uh, reward that depends only on, this, on the state and on, and on the action. Uh, now we can plug uh, this additional term. This is what is called entropy regularized uh, RL. But you can also add a, a default policy. This is what is called KL, RL. But now uh, with this new, new uh, framework, you can also, oh, sorry, too far. You can add a, you can add these additional terms such that you consider so to speak action state KL uh, RL. So and each of these terms can be zero or, uh, or or be present as you wish. But this, we are not interested in this classification of framework, which I think is nice, but what we're interested in is in what is called reward-free frameworks. So there is no notion of uh, extrinsic reward. Everything is going to be done by the agent in an intrinsic uh, motivated uh, manner. And in this case, the only reward terms that you can add is this, uh, is this uh, minus logarithm of uh, uh, policy and the minus logarithm of the, of the, of the transition metrics. Uh, by the way, you remember what empowerment was in the from the previous uh, class? Remember that empowered agents are going to be those that they like to uh, perform actions for which the, the next state is very well defined. So essentially it's very deterministic. You can also uh, get that framework by choosing beta equal uh, B negative. So it's not exactly the same empowerment uh, framework, but you can model empowerment with this very nice sequential uh, framework as well. Uh, and why it doesn't work if you use KL? Why using KL as an intrinsic reward or occupying a state, it doesn't make sense at all. So why I'm proposing only this? Well, if you use KL, let's assume that your default policy, this is KL, uh, in, in the, the instantaneous part that you will need to, to average across the policy, of course. Uh, but what you have is that this, uh, let's assume that the, the default policy is uh, uniform. What you have is minus alpha, the, this term, and then what you have is minus alpha logarithm of the number of states that you have available at every, uh, sorry, the, the number of actions that you have available at every single state. So this is clearly a penalty for uh, states 
for what you have a lot of actions. So if you're interested in, in, uh, in uh, giving uh, motivation to, uh, to an agent, to give action on a state, using KL doesn't make sense at all, okay? And then we will have some problems when we want to go to the, to the limit, uh, of co to the continuous limit, just because of this risk. Okay, so now let's uh, play with a few examples uh, of increasing complexity. So let's start with a very uh, stupid, simple uh, 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 arena where we have two agents. The H agent is the is my agent, is the one that wants to occupy uh, space, and the R agent is the traditional RL uh, reward seeking agent. Okay. So for for the two cases, I'm going to define the state as the Cartesian product between the position of the agent in this arena and the energy. Of the of the agent, so here is going to be very critical to define an internal state of the agent, and we, let's call it energy. It can be any other thing that you want. It can be more complicated than this, of course. Uh, so this is uh, energy, but it's going to be a very, it's going to play a very important role, and uh, the role that it's going to play is the following. So the agent is moving around. Whenever it's moving around or just stays still, it loses one uh, unit of energy. Okay, this is energy consumption, if you want. Every time that it reaches a food source, there are food sources in this uh, arena, it gets a, 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 a quantity of 10 units of, of food in the energy budget. And there is a maximum that it cannot reach, uh, beyond, uh, cannot go beyond that. And what is important is that we define terminal states, states for which the agent should stay away. And these uh, terminal states, I mean, this is a very natural definition it corresponds to energy equal to zero. And then it is equal to zero, then the, the agent stops uh, moving, and then the entropy of those states are going to be much lower than any other states in the array. Okay. So here we model, uh, this is the H agent with the intrinsic reward. This is our, ag our agent with the external reward. So let's see how they compare uh, the two of them. So not very surprisingly, the H agent moves around in the first room for a Actually, but now this covers a second rule. The R agent is still hitting that uh, reward. So not very surprisingly, the H agent starts to move around and uh, you see a little bit of goal-directed behavior. So there is not a purely random walk, a stupid random walk. A random walk will be highly suboptimal in this case. So it's a, it's a goal-directed random walk if you want. So from time to time, when the energy goes down, the agent goes straight away in a deterministic fashion to a food source to get the reward, okay? But the goal is not get the, the reward. The goal is move around. And the agent goes to this reward location only when it's needed, so to speak. But if you compare the two behavior, you could say that this is kind of like depression, depressive-like behavior. It's like it's speaking all the time again and again. And this one is more like a lively, joyful, Feel like uh, behave. Okay. So yeah, you you just triggered something for me. So your can you take the state and action space and think of it actually as doing a random walk in in that in that graph? Yeah, but that's the yeah. So this whole framework is essentially constrained random walks. Yeah. And so the optimal policy in a sense is like something to do with the stationary distribution in that case. Right. 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 Okay. Right. Yeah, but it's essentially random works. This is what you want to do, but it's highly constrained by the, by the physical properties of the environment and your system. And this is what creates goal-directed behavior because a pure random walk won't be, you won't, you won't call it a goal, uh, like a intelligent behavior. In, in Although it's the one that maximizes this action state occupancy. Okay. I mean, this is more like, if you, so we, we can go later if you want to. Yeah, because I have more several uh, uh, samples. So this is the one thing, one thing that there is with, with some probability, the, the agent on the left should, should disappear, should die. Yeah. So why does not it happen? Well, it happens, uh, it depends on the size of the environment and it decreases exponentially with the, so, sorry, the survival time increases exponentially with the size of the environment. So uh, in practice, yeah, in practice, when you run these simulations, they live for very, very long time. But eventually, you're right, uh, they die, and we can prove that. 
but I, let me go back to that because I don't understand why it grows so exponentially because you have a discounting factor. So the yeah, but you have more more states to to visit and to be kind of calm and relax. Uh, essentially, you are pushing the terminal space a little bit farther away. But that totally depends on the structure of what's in the environment. So you can control that in many, many different ways. So in an infinite environment, you say the probability of dying is zero. Um, that seems very strange because suppose you have just one food source and you have a discounting you are, I mean, your discounted function, then that I don't know. If it's I infinite, I don't know. So when, it, when you said no. it's exponentially we long no. with a large infinite uh, markup decision process, we don't know. We don't no, know. but you said with n, it's exponentially large, so that means more or less infinite, right? Yeah, but um, yeah, okay, let's talk more on the train. But this is empirical observation, so we don't, I don't know whether this is going to go over, over, over and over. Uh, for increasing size. Let's hold that there. Okay. there. Yeah, there was a question over there, right? Or maybe it's... Yeah. Oh, no, it's fine. Is it some? Okay. Okay, not surprising. You uh, occupy more space in here in this case. Uh, and just to tell you that this behavior is observed for a broad range of parameters. You, sh you shouldn't show results only for one set of parameters, but for a broad range. So it's false. Okay, so now let's go to a second example, also very, very simple. Uh, and now we have a cat and, uh, and a mouse. The cat is, the, sorry, the mouse is the agent. Uh, is the uh, agent that wants to occupy, yes. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you like define rewards in a certain way, you can also generate that sort of a behavior, like the exploratory behavior that you showed on you. Uh, not really, because you don't have a stochasticity. You can have a stochastic policy. But this is not optimal. But you cannot define rewards in a way that that becomes optimal. If the rewards are themselves stochastic, uh, then yes. Uh, if uh, then you will have variability. But uh, but if you take the same framework and you compare the sorry the same the same environment, and you compare the age with uh, with our agent, they are very different always. And I'm going to give you more and more example. So, uh, so for instance, in, in the previous example, we added some noise into the into the R agent. So actually, we added the epsilon greedy uh, strategy. Actually, this is a lot of noise, and nevertheless, the agent becomes uh, it's almost very really deterministic. It moves a little bit, but it doesn't want to do so. Actually, if I chose epsilon equal to zero, you will see that the agent is all the time that on uh, the the foot saw with no motion. So here I actually put myself even in the worst case scenario. So where I put noise into the into the air agent to see whether the type of noise, the type of behaviors observed are comparable or not to the H agent. Yeah, but for example, you could have a reward structure which is instead of having a negative reward, a positive reward for changing the state or something like that. And then that could also explain similar behaviors, of course. It would not be exactly similar, like uh, yeah. I would like to yeah. I would be happy to discuss uh, and see whether that can be formalized in terms of Bellman equation, whether that doesn't explode in terms of uh, of states and this kind of thing. But we can discuss uh, very interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this uh, scenario: the mouse is the is the agent is trying to occupy the space. The cat is just passively uh, being attracted to the cat to try to catch it. Okay. So here there are two types of terminal states. One is when the, the mouse is, is caught by the cat, the mouse uh, dies. So if the, if, the, uh, if the mouse wants to occupy a space, actually a, a, a state space, wants to avoid the, the cat, okay? We're not telling this to the, to, the, to the mouse, but the mouse figure out this out. And secondly, the mouse needs to get some energy. If the energy goes to zero, then it dies. So it has to go also to the food source. Okay, so this is the R agent that gets some reward by, uh, by uh, uh, getting the, the reward. <laughs> so they, they, the mouse is kind of smart because it teases the cat. And as the cat goes to the, to the left, then you can see it's teasing the cat. It's go, it goes around the wall and gets the cheese. And again, it's doing the same. 
So the R agent is not stupid. It discovered a very good uh, strategy, a very good behavior to both avoid the cap and get to the food source. In a consistent manner. Here, the mouse must know something about how the cat behaves. Yeah, it knows the transition metrics. It knows the, the transition cat. metrics yeah. of the cat. Yeah. Has a lot of experience with cat. Yeah, that is a, this is a specific map. But let's see, let's see now the, the H agent. So the H agent it starts to do something very similar to, to the R agent. So there is these clockwise rotations. But it also uses counterclockwise rotations. So did you see that? So sometimes goes uh, clockwise and sometimes goes anti-clockwise. So this agent has discovered a different strategy to solve uh, the same task. And it shows variability in this study. Sometimes follows one, sometimes uh, switches the, to the other one. Uh, we can quantify uh, we can quantify that like this. So this is uh, for a, uh, a range of parameters. The H agent has a probability of uh, performing clockwise uh, rotation that is close to 0.5. It's pretty much random. Sometimes the one, sometimes the other one. While the R agent is consistently biased to choose the clockwise uh, rotation. So if you quantify behaviors now in this more complex uh, fashion, you see that uh, H agents generate more interest in richer uh, repertoires, behavioral repertoires, as compared to the boring, although it's more, uh, R agent. Uh, so this is another comparison. Uh, maybe I, can, I should go fast. So I'm going to skip this one uh, because I explained. Okay, so now this is a third example where this is a highly nonlinear system. So this is the continuous domain space. This is the balancing uh, a pole in a moving cart. Uh, I mean, this has been solved in, uh, in, in many, many different ways. This is one way of solving it. This is the R agent. And uh, here we define terminal states as being those when the cart hits uh, one of the boundaries, you know, of the boundaries or when the pole is, uh, falls below uh, 45 degrees. So we define this as being terminal states that you saw. And this uh, agent gets a little bit of reward whenever it gets uh, fully vertical. So this agent is very good at balancing the pole, but in terms of behavior, uh, you know, it's, it's doing the stuff, but not much, right? Well, this other guy uh, swing is back and forth, uh, balancing the pole in a, in a kind of behavior that we could call it even dancing. Like even in this very low dimensional uh, dimensional system. So the dynamical repertoire of uh, the H agent is much larger than the R agent. And now let me compare, uh, let's go to this plot over here, because this is super interesting plot. So what I plotted over here is the percentage of survival time. So this is the survival time of both uh, the H and the R agent as a function of, uh, of epsilon. So of course the H agent doesn't, doesn't depend on the epsilon for the epsilon greedy component for the noise component that we could add to the R agent to generate more variability. So the H agent uh, pretty much survives all very long episodes that we have simulated with probability one. And with the R agent, when, uh, when epsilon is zero, that actually should be, should be very good at balancing the, the pole, actually survives less than the H agent. And this is why uh, entropy regular, uh, entropy, the entropy term is used as a way to regularize uh, problems in, uh, in RL. So here, the regularization that takes place is more like a numerical, uh, of a numerical fashion. So approximating or solving this, uh, this uh, set of linear equations involves highly nonlinear equations that you have to approximate. So you make numerical mistakes, numerical errors in those approximations. And when you try to solve it without noise, then these errors propagate way more than when you add a little bit of entropy uh, component on, uh, on it. So essentially the entropy component is smooths out the value function, and then you can perform much better value iteration under these approximations. <laughs> epsilon is the, is, the, is the parameter that controls the epsilon greedy strategy or the error agent. So is the is epsilon, if you remember, is the probability of choosing a random uh, action. Now you're not solving that much. Yeah, this is this is these are solutions for uh, numerical uh, st statistics. 
from the agents that are optimal, either the R agent is optimal, knowing that it has this epsilon, or the H agent is optimal. So can you say again? Then I don't know what you just can you remind me? Epsilon is um, so in epsilon greedy, you can you know the value of the options, then you're going to take the option that maximizes the value with probability one minus epsilon plus epsilon n, but you can forget about this. I mean, don't worry. Epsilon is it's typically small. More than one for sure, but typically small. And then the probability yeah, we cannot of the see the blackboard. Okay, sorry. So the probability of taking a suboptimal one is epsilon divided by n. Yeah. Uh, and this epsilon uh, is just a is just a component that we add to the agent to generate variability. I think I'm just missing something. So where is this? Where do you insert this? This is only for the R agent. Yeah. So this whole thing is only for the R. Yeah, but where where in the is the policy that is being followed? Yeah. So it's, it's like a. a so the the only the you introduce an error term in the class. The agent knows that it's going to perform this uh, that it cannot control perfectly well the actions. So the agent is fully aware that from time to time it's going to choose any of the other action with some probability and it's fully aware of that. And now it solves a very equation associated to this problem. And why can't you do that for the agent? Uh, we can do that, but uh, it's going to be worse than the, what we obtain over there. So for the H agent. Uh, we can do that. Yeah, but since you compare them as a function of epsilon, compare the two with the same modification. Well, we are comparing uh, an agent that generates a lot of variability with another agent that has increased epsilon generates more and more variability in behavior, and we want it to be very close to uh, to that agent, and then we want to compare those. We could do what you say, but I don't think it's going to add a lot of uh, so a lot of how would the red curve look? Uh, it's going to decrease. It's going to decrease because uh, you have less control of uh, here. But just compare epsilon equal to zero, where one is the H agent and the other is the R agent. The H agent is still better than the R agent. That's numerical out. Is that red line mean of their survival times? And this is the fraction, the percentage of the uh, of survive uh, episodes. These episodes are very long, oh. and in all of the episodes, the H agent never hit the the bar. Oh, all of them. Yeah. And their agent, as you can see, is super sensitive to epsilon. When epsilon goes down, uh, like it's 0.01 or 0.02, then it does terribly. And this is because this type of variability is not the one that is uh, good to uh, to interact with the with the with the with the, uh, with the environment. So you run for a fixed time, and you see whether it survives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but you can compute that for the the spread survival time, and you get pretty much the same result. Yeah, come on. In. This H agent here is this just regularizing with the rewards, or is this no rewards? Yeah, for the R agent, there is a little bit of reward, and the and the epsilon. I'm oh, no, sorry for the H agent. For the H, for the H agent, we can put this uh, reward, and it doesn't affect the behavior much. But it's getting better. Well, it's surviving longer yeah. without it. Should be longer. Yeah. So, so you're saying if you did add this error epsilon in the red curve, it would not. Yeah, it won't decrease that much uh, faster. But that's something to be done. So I don't. Uh... But what what's the explanation? Let's talk later about that. Okay. Um, okay, so this is this is an example where there is altruistic uh, behavior. So this framework can also lead to uh, quite interesting behaviors like this one. So here we have an owner that has a pet, and the owner can open and close a fence. Okay, and we're going to assume that the state of the the reward of the owner, uh, which is the agent, depends on the on the policy entropy and the transition entropy. But critically, the state of the owner is the owner location in this arena, and also the pet's location. Okay. So essentially, this this uh, agent uh, feels uh, motivated to uh, allow 
the path to be free because that's going to, that's going to correspond to more uh, state entropy that uh, the agent should, uh, should uh, look for, uh, forward. The only problem is that the agent can open and close the defense from time to time. And now he has, and of course, touching the and closing the defense, the uh, the, the, this key to open or close the door also is, uh, is good. You want to perform this action many, many times. So this is rewarding for the, for the agent. So here the agent has to trade off between its own freedom to touch this button versus uh, the freedom of the pet. And this trade-off totally depends on the value of beta, as you can see. If beta is zero, so if it agent doesn't care about the entropy of the, of the pet, then the fraction of time that the fence is open is, uh, is 0.5, meaning that the agent is touching all the time this, uh, this button. But if beta is very large, then the agent decides to trade off and to reduce its own entropy, its own action entropy by touching the, the, the fence, it leaves it open and allows the, 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 the pad to be free. So you have this kind of a, a fun, interesting uh, behavior. Okay. Uh, by setting beta zero there, uh, isn't the owner also restricting their own uh, entropy change of like changing state? Uh, you are right. Um, you are right that we should do this by taking at least into account the owner's location to be a more fair comparison. But I think it's going to be pretty much the same. Maybe slopes change a little bit here, but it's going to be the same. Okay, so in the last five minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how do we take this framework to understand neural variability. So, uh, so uh, Jonathan has also been talking about different ways of conceptualizing neural variability. Uh, over there, we have uh, uh, Giorgio, uh, an expert on neural variability. So I'm going to propose yet another theory of neural variability. So in this room, I think there are going to be three or four or five different theories of neural variability by the end of the summer course. Uh, so neural variability, I don't, I don't think I need to go uh, into the details. Uh, there is a lot of variability. These are the same uh, stimulus, different trials, <laughs> different responses. Uh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so what the neural uh, me uh, mechanisms of variability uh, are. So there are like uh, uh, different views about uh, what is the origin of uh, neural variability. Uh, one standard approach is that, you know, the brain has some stochastic components, such as a stochastic uh, vesicle release that is very spread out in the brain. Because all synapses, they have a stochastic uh, vesicle uh, release. Well, this, plus amplification through uh, recurring connections can generate uh, variability in a neural network that you just, just simulate. Another account, uh, even more standard, is thinking of uh, neural dynamics as chaotic. And because you have chaotic dynamics, okay, you will never see exactly the same response uh, in the neural activity. So let me put forward the, the hypothesis that variability is not the result of this, uh, of this uh, could be the result of any of these mechanisms, but actually, it fulfills a goal. And the goal is to occupy activity space. So you have your brain. You don't want to be your brain uh, stupid. So essentially, the brain is pushing neurons to do different stuff more and more, uh, up to some limit, of course. Uh, so what the limits are? Well, the limits are that, OK, you want to generate neural variability as long as this doesn't result into non-adaptive behavior. You don't do crazy things. And as long as the brain activity doesn't enter into pathological uh, regimes. As long as you avoid these two things, you would like to have uh, a large variability, as unconstrained as possible. Okay, so let's assume that we want to control a, a, a nonlinear chaotic system. So I'm going to be plotting here the activity of many neurons as a function of time. Uh, so if you take a chaotic uh, uh, nonlinear system that are used uh, in the literature, Cameron described uh, some of these models uh, before, you get that there is a stochastic behavior in the activity. The activity goes uh, 
uh, up and down. And there is a little bit, uh, a little problem with these type of networks because many neurons, from pretty much every neuron from time to time gets to saturation. This corresponds to neurons uh, with tan, uh, hyperbolic uh, tan uh, trans uh, uh, transfer function. And the activity of these neurons go to one. So essentially this is saturation regime of, of the neurons. And eventually all the neurons get to that uh, regime uh, once in, uh, in a while. Well, this seems to be a problem because you don't want neurons to be burned as they go to the saturated regime. You don't want neurons to fire too, too high. So why don't we define like a terminal state as something uh, saying like, look, if a neuron goes beyond activity 0.9, that's going to be bad. So this is arbitrary, but let's assume that this is going to be bad for the brain and you want to avoid that. And at the same time, you want to regenerate as much vulnerability as you can. So this is the, the threat. So, so you want to get a huge vulnerability while preventing you from going into epileptic, uh, epilepsy, okay? Uh, okay, so this is a neural network that uh, follows this, uh, these equations over here, uh, gets some actions from a, a, a FIFO one network that generates uh, probabilistic, uh, probabilistically actions. And uh, essentially we use the framework that we have described before to train through a, a, a FIFO one network, the value function, the now approximation, we enforce that this value function is self-consistent with itself. Okay, so we train this, uh, this network and what we find is the following. So initially in the first trials, what happens? Well, this is again the, the chaotic uh, system that goes to, into epilepsy. Now we go, <laughs> the system that uh, at the beginning in the first trials hits the threshold and it's burned, but as, as slowly is, is learning to generate a lot of vulnerability while avoiding those, uh, those states. And this is a very hard problem because essentially this is a nonlinear system uh, that is chaotic. So perturbations at one time uh, propagate exponentially uh, in the future. And as you can see, as time passes, the volume of these traces grow and grow. Grow and grow, and you can see that it's almost risky sometimes. Sometimes, well, in this case, maybe in this trial, no, but there will be another trial where there's going to be like a risky look at this, uh, like at this point where it's almost getting to, to the threshold, but not quite. So it's solving very nicely this, uh, this problem of generating vulnerability while uh, fulfilling this, uh, this, uh, this goal. Okay, so let me conclude. I have one minute, so I think it's uh, perfect timing. Uh, are we really utility maximizers? So I really, that in your future career, you think strongly about this. Maybe we are. Uh, I think that if you should think about this, we have seen that defining rewards is problematic. It's difficult, but there are many techniques, uh, but can be problematic. So we have to think more about that. So here we have proposed like different principle for, for behavior. And we have uh, stated that the goal of uh, intelligence is to occupy action state uh, path uh, space. Rewards are still important. I mean, we're not saying that rewards are not relevant at all. Rewards are important because they have to be sought to their, their uh, means to achieve the goal of moving more and better in the future. So they are important, of course. Uh, we have seen that entropy seeking behavior is kind of uh, lively, uh, energetic and playful. So this is kind of like an interesting uh, observation. Uh, very interestingly, goal directed behavior emerges as long as you have some terminal states that need to be avoided, and as long as you have uh, rewards that have to be sought to, to be able to, to, to generate goal-directed behavior, but it's not guided. This framework is not guided to generate this goal-directed behavior. It emerges naturally uh, from, from these principles. And I leave this as an open uh, uh, possibility that this could be a good way to account and to start to think about neural activity uh, variability in the brain. So with this, I think that the Beijing guys are going to be very happy because uh, it's not going to take more than maybe just two minutes to, to wrap up. Any questions from Beijing or, or here, of course?
Yes, thanks. Um, so if we were wondering whether evolution might have taken this, this path to, to try to design us to be entropy maximizers. Um, it, it seems pretty clear, at least in outlines, how you might subsume drive to seek food in this framework. You want to extend your life to have more time to right, occupy right, right, right. space. What about drives like reproduction? Would you need to add that in as a... No, I think that this comes out naturally from this uh, framework. So it's, it's like going, going back to the altruist uh, example. If you uh, think of the state of others, as a part of your entropy, then you want to have children so that there is more, uh, but indirectly because that's going, to, that's going to change your state more, but also directly if you perceive it as part of the, of the state that you want to maximize. So there are two versions of that approach. I don't know which one is the more interesting or whether there are different ways of approaching this, but you can think of uh, having children as a way to maximize your future entropy. So you will die, but you know, you have uh, people who look like you in the future. Wait, how, how is it going people who look like me in the future maximizing my entropy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's something that of course cannot happen in your brain. It has to happen somehow like in the, yeah, in the selection process of uh, nature. Uh, yeah, yeah, but that's a good point. Uh, you, you will feel like a super uh, intelligence to tell, look, this is the way things uh, have to, to go. But yeah, you're right. And you're stretching really too much right now, the, the framework, but I think we could get even there, but not yet. There's a question from Beijing. Sorry, now. So maybe Beijing question? Yeah. If the environment is very stationary, would our agent be more adaptive than each agent? Uh, both are going to be, I mean, we have played with different, with different examples. And the truth is that the, our agent survives less than the H agent consistently. So we don't have a definite answer. So, and this happens for both deterministic environments and also for stochastic environments. There was another question over here. Um, does this depend at all on the uh, discount factor? I'm imagining like if we are too short-sighted, yeah. entropy in the short term would kill us or? Yeah, so if, if gamma is smaller than one, then eventually the probability of surviving is, uh, is zero. So you will die. But this is kind of interesting thought because, because the death state is also a state that you would like to visit. Eventually. It's yet, it's yet, it's yet another state. And if, if you are short-sighted, uh, gamma is more than one, then eventually you cannot predict uh, these bottlenecks that will give you directly to, to the death state. So you are going to be a little bit far sighted. So if, if gamma is, uh, is one, then you are an uh, infinity uh, lift uh, agent. And you know, but the frameworks, I mean, it, it depends now uh, what is gamma in different examples. Yeah. But the, the truth is that if gamma is very close to one, then I mean, lifetimes are really very long. They're super long. Actually, we have to make a gamma very small to see the agent's life uh, die. Sorry, otherwise the uh, direct exponentially long. We still don't have the full theory of why is that, but the... yeah. Um, just to make sure I understood your idea at the end of the presentation. Um, I guess are you suggesting the idea that um, the the sort of the drive to yeah. to occupy more and more action states is sort of encoded within like individual neurons and, and sort of their variability somehow. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one way to, to look at it. So, so like neurons sort of tend to be driven to sort of right. occupying different sort of firing states in order to sort of explore. Right, so, so you have to be, uh, see, uh, conceive of the brain as something situated within a body and within the environment. So the brain generates variability the, this variability generates uh, random or uh, variable behaviors, as Ale described. And, and you know, these two things are coupled, uh, it kind of pretty much in like one-to-one -one manner. Uh, so if you believe in this story, then yes, the, 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 the variability in behavior is, a, uh, and the large variability in behavior is a result of a principle of how the brain is wired to generate variability in, in neural activity. 
but this needs really to be explored. So that's why I say the possible account of a, uh, but uh, I'm very enthusiastic about this idea nowadays. So, um, so. Okay, so like in that sense, I mean, this is a bit of a stretch, but like could something more like abstract and cognitive, like, you know, learning language, for example, be sort of construed in, in this sort of framework of occupying more active states where you're sort of trying to yeah. learn? I'm not an expert in languages, so uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Uh, I think what, uh, probably one last question uh, from Beijing. Okay. Uh, I noticed that H agent uh, performs better uh, than R agent in keeping the balance of the path and away from the path. Why? Uh, okay, I didn't notice that. Say again, say again. What is the, the observation? That H agent uh, performs better than R agent in keeping the balance of the path. And running away from the cat. You mean the, the balance is the distance with the uh, with the cat or so what, what we know is that uh, if by balance you mean like uh, like uh, being in a safe distance with respect to the here there is no balance, here there is no more. I mean uh, the yeah. distance of the standing up, so I don't really understand. So but if the question is whether there is um um there is some strategy as to uh, keeping the distance constant between the, uh, the, uh, the cat and the mouth. It means that the H agent is keeping the distance a little bit more constant than the R agent. Right. Uh, let's thank Ruben. Beijing, uh, we say good night to good you, night. <laughs> and right. uh, we'll uh, resume tomorrow for uh, for all of us. Um, in Basel, we have a special presentation from 